Well, good afternoon uh, to those of you who are uh, listening to this webinar from uh, Saeed Business School in Oxford jointly with uh, HEC Paris, which is part of a number of webinars that um, the CCC programme, the Consulting and Coaching for Change programme, is running this year. Um, it's actually quite an opportune or a pretentious day, perhaps, to have this webinar, which is Election Day in the UK. Uh, where we're electing a, a potentially a new leader, or perhaps the old leader, uh, uh, of, of as prime minister, and we're we're talking today about uh, visionary leaders. Debatable whether either of our potential candidates are visionary. That's up for discussion. Uh, but uh, we we're really looking at this in the context of uh, organisations, organisational change, also political leadership as well, and we're very uh, happy to be able to have. Uh, uh, Professor Michael Maccabee uh, to talk to us today about this these themes of uh, leadership, uh, narcissism, narcissism and vision. Michael uh, is a long-term contributor to the CCC programme. He was uh, one of the founding faculty and has taught on the programme for many years. He has written extensively uh, about leadership uh, in his many books and in fact, this year, his classic book on uh, productive narcissists will be reissued again. Uh, Michael has worked with a range of uh, top leaders, political uh, and corporate leaders over his lifetime uh, and comes at these issues with, with, from a range of different perspectives. I mean, at, at heart, he's an anthropologist. He's an historian to some degree. Uh, he's a social scientist. He's worked with trade unions and managers. He, he also uh, has had considerable impact in certain uh, uh, countries as well, having received uh, an award, uh, a prize from the King of Sweden, no less, for his contribution to Swedish society, for his work uh, on uh, workplace democracy and, and change in Sweden. So uh, today we're very happy to have him here. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy the discussion. And of course, you have time for questions as well at the end. Uh, so as we go through, please feel free to write a question. We'll take those uh, at the end of the uh, presentation and we'll have probably about 15 minutes or so to, to respond. So please, you know, as, as ideas and questions come to you, please write them, write them down and we'll, uh, we'll deal with those. But I'll, without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael, who's going to talk about the promise and peril of visionary narcissistic leaders. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, a day to start with. In times of great change, like the present time, we have visionary leaders have always emerged who want to change the world to fit their visions. Uh, these visionaries typically have a narcissistic personality. And it's very important today we understand them uh, their strengths and weaknesses, how to work with them, and also, if you are one, how to become effective. Um, change the, uh, go on to the next. Yeah, I wanted to start out, we use the term narcissist. Narcissism becomes kind of linguistic garbage can. We use it uh, to, when we really need to talk about egoism, grandiosity, selfishness, arrogance, Egocentrism, these are, these are qualities that any personality can have. Uh, actually, <clears throat> narcissism, if you really, technically narcissism really is the drive to survive. Uh, if we didn't have narcissism, we wouldn't think our own survival was any more important than any other creatures. So the real question isn't just narcissism, it's a type of narcissistic personality. Uh, next slide. Next. We all have personalities, and there are different types of personalities. Um, four key personalities, and we're all a mix of these things, but four, the four kind of main types have both positive and negative tendencies. That's a caring type of personality and a leader if you look at the work of Adam Grant from the uh, Pennsylvania Wharton School, his study shows that caring leaders are either the most effective or the least effective, depending upon how productive they are. 
Uh, we also know that the exacting, obsessive personality can, it can be a kind of control freak. Uh, some people think that describes Theresa May. Um, and we have the visionary, the narcissistic, which we'll talk more about. And finally, the adaptive personality, which is more and more the type of personality that I see developing, which in its negative sense is a marketing personality, a kind of personality which changes like uh, uh, more adapting to uh, whatever works. Uh, next slide. Freud talked about normal narcissists. I mean, when, when we hear about narciss narcissists, usually from psychiatrists, they talk about narcissistic personality disorders. Uh, that's because psychiatrists are not trained to look at normal or productive personalities. So they're always looking for a pathology. But Freud talked about normal narcissists and he actually, <clears throat> he actually described himself as, as this type. <clears throat> and we'll see, uh, we'll see that a lot of, uh, a lot of the leaders who have been the most change focused visionary leaders have had this type of personality that Freud says impress others as being personalities, especially suited to act as a support for others take on the role of leaders, give a fresh stimulus to cultural development or to damage the established state of affairs. And if people have, these people don't have a strong superego, they have to develop their own sense of ego ideal, their own sense of values and morality, which can be good or bad. Let's uh, look at the next one. We look at... <clears throat> We look at the qualities, the productive versus the negative or pathological traits of narcissistic uh, leaders. We see on the productive side visioning, independent thinking, risk taking, passionate about ideas, charisma, voracious learning, persevering, alert to threats, sense of humor, which you see in some of the some of the. Uh, best of the narcissistic leaders like Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and John F. Kennedy. But on the pathological side, <clears throat> extreme sensitivity to criticism. They don't listen. Paranoia, extreme competitiveness, anger and putting people down, exaggerating, lying, lack of self-knowledge, isolated, grandiose. Next one. We are all mixes, so we can look at different types of narcissistic leaders. For example, next one, we look at the visionary caring people, see people like Roosevelt, Gandhi, Obama, um, the, uh, these are people who uh, um, Mandela, for example, great leaders who have cared for people. Next. You see um, <clears throat> visionary exacting types. These tend to be the types of visionary leaders who create industries like Steve Jobs of Apple or uh, Jeff Bezos, Henry Ford, Elon Musk. These are all people who have some of the negative side, but they have the vision to create new industries, new ideas. Next. We see the visionary adaptive types. These are, these are people who have visions but are very responsive, almost like radar type to what people want and often change their views and their attitudes according to what they, according to what uh, works. And so uh, this type often has a kind of contradiction because their vision is sometimes in contradiction to the public they're trying to please and and uh, and, uh, and and succeed with. Next, here are the pathological.
pathological narcissistic leaders. These are these are leaders who uh, want to change the world and have ended up murdering thousands, even millions of people. They're familiar to all of us. Um, these are the kind of pathological narcissistic leaders that may seem to people at first to give them a sense of uh, glory and development. Certainly Napoleon in the, in the beginning seemed to be a great liberator and ended up uh, practically destroying his country. Next. What type is Donald Trump? Um, a lot of, obviously a lot of, a lot of uh, psychiatrists have been saying he has a narcissistic personality disorder. Um, but they leave out the fact, I mean, this is a, this, it would be, it certainly would be very sick if he thought he was president of the United States, but in fact, he is president of the United States. In fact, he has developed a business and become a billionaire. Uh, in his book, How to Think Like a Billionaire, uh, he, he cites my descriptions of uh, Be Bezos and, uh, and Jobs and says he's like them. Well, he, he's much more, I think, like the uh, marketing type. Uh, in the past, he's been a liberal. Now, he, one of his problems right now is that uh, he only seems to respond to this, this reference group, maybe 35% of the country who, who like him and whatever he does. And that makes him more and more alienated. Uh, from the majority of the country, um, he's also a uh, he's also a person who has a very powerful aesthetic sense. But that turns he wants everything to be beautiful, even the wall with Mexico. But that uh, that leads often uh, uh, to distortion, to uh, to lying in order to make things sound good, look good. Um, so uh, Trump has certain positive narcissistic visionary qualities, but also the negative side. And uh, one of the great problems, I think, is uh, that <clears throat> there's a kind of vicious circle where he's being attacked uh, strongly by the elite, and he responds more and more aggressively and negatively and it's a vicious cycle but let's look at let's look at how how do narcissistic visionaries succeed next <clears throat> one way is responding or creating crises N narcissistic visionaries they thrive on crisis and uh, some of them have responded. Napoleon, the end of the French Revolution, responded, created um, a uh, system of uh, stability after the revolution. FTR with the um, Depression, Churchill, World War II, Lincoln with, with the Civil War in the United States. These visionaries responded to crises, but some some have created their own crises. Julius Caesar created a crisis in, the, in Rome. Hitler created the crisis, created war. Mao created crisis with revolution. And Trump has created crisis, running, running for president, saying the country is in trouble when actually I uh, was doing very well, uh, exaggerating, lying about uh, the fact that the United States was in trouble and was being uh, um, taken advantage of by other countries. Um, they also uh, they also succeed by their personality. Next slide. <clears throat> they succeed when they have vision, purpose. They succeed when they're able to partner. I mean, we we take the example of Steve Jobs. When he tried to run Apple all by himself, he was fired. He realized he had to partner Tim Cook, Joni Ives, people who, who complement 
limited his ability by bringing, working with people and systems and design, courage, and motivating people with charisma, giving them a sense of, of participating in something great. Um, next. How they fail. Well, first of all, personality. They don't, they're not listening. I remember I was coaching a, uh, a very visionary narcissistic leader, and we were sitting around with a uh, group of the vice presidents, and they were trying to tell him that his idea would fail, and he wasn't hearing it. And I turned to him, I said, I, I said, let's, let's take a break. And I said to him, you know, you're not listening. And he said to me, I didn't get here by listening to other people. That was true. But he also got fired by not listening to other people. They overextend themselves like Napoleon. They become reckless and they lose support. <clears throat> I, I've seen that uh, in Sweden with uh, um, Gyllenhammer of Volvo lost support when he tried to expand, uh, tried to uh, create a, a uh, relationship, partnering uh, with Renault and his own people uh, opposed him and got to the uh, share owners and he lost his support. Next. Now, how do you work with them? I mean, many of us have had the experience of working with a narcissist. First of all, let me say something. I would not, I would not work with one of these people unless I felt that what they were trying to create was positive, was something that really um, would increase the quality of life for people. Um, better products, services, uh, not somebody who was just out for their own power and glory and were exploited in. But if you do find someone like this, who is really trying to create something positive, if you were working for Franklin Roosevelt or Barack Obama, you need to understand their vision. You need to help achieve it if you believe in it. If not, you should get out. You need to have a complementary competence. They're not going to work with you unless they see you have something to add to them. I mean, like like Jobs knew that that uh, Tim Cook and Joni Ives had, had abilities he didn't have. You've got to be available at all hours. They call you all the time. You've got to make sure they get the credit. Um, it's, it's interesting... Uh, uh, people have criticized, uh, newspaper people have criticized our Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, because he, he doesn't talk to the press. But he's very clever. He knows that Trump uh, do doesn't like anyone else getting credit. And anyone else who gets credit gets in the doghouse. You need to have an exit strategy. Um, and you need to have independent sources for self-esteem. I don't think I could have worked with these people unless I was also writing books and had my own way of feeling uh, self-esteem because I knew I wasn't going to get much from them. Um, next. How to coach narcissists. Uh, you're going to, many of you are going to find that if you're in coaching, you're going to be uh, coaching a narcissist, well, there's some of the same points as working for a narcissist, but focus on what will make them successful. Um, you know, if you, if you say to them, if you do this, it'll be bad for the company, they're not going to listen as well as if you say it's going to be bad for you. You're not going to succeed if you do this. Not that the company's going to be in trouble if you do this. Help them pick the right partners. Oh, that's a big problem for uh, narcissistic leaders. I have found that one of the major things they want from me is help them pick the right partners. They often pick bad partners who uh, play up to them, who, uh, who uh, flatter them, and uh, are really out for, uh, for their own well-being, not for 
to them. Learn from and for them. Um, and understand their ego ideal, help them live up to it if they have a positive ego ideal. Uh, I have found that's very important. Uh, all narcissistic leaders, visionaries, they have an ideal who they want to be. And even Abraham Lincoln had this ideal of being like George Washington. Um, narcissistic visionaries have a sense of who they want to be, and if they're not living up to their ideal, they feel ashamed of themselves, and they uh, and it brings out the worst in them. Uh, finally, next. Now you may be a narcissistic leader and want to be more productive. What do you need to do? I mean, I find in the uh, working within the CCC program over the last 14 years or so, uh, a number of a number of the participants in the program. Uh, Want to be nuts? Are narcissistic visionaries who really want to develop? I mean, part of the, part of the reason that they're in the program is wanting to develop their productive capabilities to make their visions real. And if so, develop, communicate, and practice a leadership philosophy is crucial. We all have a philosophy. It may be conscious or unconscious. Uh, for many people, their philosophy is really just getting ahead in life and doing what uh, works, uh, depending on their type of personality. But people who are the most productive and creative make their philosophy conscious, real. What is your purpose? What are you trying to create? What are the practical values essential to make that purpose real? You see this in, in, in a great... Um, some of the really great visionary leaders who have uh, created great companies. They, Henry Ford's purpose was everyone should have a be able to buy a car. And to do that, he knew that he had to make a car that was affordable. He had to make it practical. Um, he had to develop the, the, the values of the system to make it happen. And... Uh, and so we and uh, Hewlett Packard. I, I interviewed way back Bill Hewlett. And purpose, I asked him, what's the purpose of HP? He said the purpose of HP uh, was to make products, instruments that help technical people do their job better. And to do that, he had practical values of excellence, paying for people to go back and take engineering courses at Stanford. Um, he had a uh, collaboration between development, marketing, and production, working as a team. He had the idea of loyalty. Nobody was laid off. Uh, if there was a downturn, everybody would take uh, a day off uh, every two weeks without pay. And, uh, and he wanted people who were entrepreneurial. Um, I said to him at the time, if you want people who are entrepreneurial, they're going to leave the company. He said, I know that but because we treated them so well, they're going to be our, they're our, going to be our customers and our suppliers. And that was the beginning of Silicon Valley. Came right out of that kind of philosophy. Second of all, find partners that complement your skills and are, tell you hard truths. Be open, listen and learn, and understand your followers. Understand what um, what's important to them. Engage them as collaborators, and uh, be sure to give recognition to others. Also, um, it may go against the grain, but it's the only way you're going to find collaborators who are working with you. Uh, with that, uh, let me open this to your questions or comments. Right. Maybe I could start, Michael. Um, a lot of the examples that you gave were uh, were male. I didn't see any female leaders in there. And uh, I was wondering, what's your view about the sort of gender difference here? I mean, are most narcissistic, productive 
narcissists or visionary narcissists, mostly male? Are women different in any way? Or, I mean, what's your... There are, there are some female ones that I have seen, like Oprah Winfrey. Um, one of the things you find, uh, and some others that people may not have know so well, who, women who have created industries like Helena Rubinstein and others, um, thing is... <laughs> I've worked with about 30 narcissistic leaders, and they've all been men. So uh, the other ones that I can see, I have to uh, see from biographies and, mm. um, and uh, some interviews I've done with, with a couple. I remember one, <clears throat> one entrepreneurial uh, woman, narcissistic leaders in technology, said to me, uh, uh, you know, um, I didn't want to be like my mother, um, and I couldn't be like my father because I'm a woman. So I had to create my own sense of self and meaning. And this is something I find with narcissistic visionaries. They, they don't identify with their parents. They have, they have to create their own ego ideal, their own sense of meaning. But women are there too. The, uh, the other thing I was kind of curious about was, um, I mean, reading the biographies of some of the people that you've mentioned, they, they quite often have absent fathers. The father figure is not there. I don't know if you've got any observations on that, about the kind of family system they come from and how that's relevant. Uh, yeah, that's very relevant. I mean, take, take Frank Lloyd Wright, obviously a narcissistic visionary. Um, when he was a little baby, his mother threw the father out of the house and she put around his crib pictures of all the, of the greatest cathedrals in Europe. Uh, <laughs> if you look at some of our narcissistic presidents, uh, Abraham Lincoln hated his father. I had nothing to do with him. He said his father treated him like a slave, would rent him out to others. Ronald Reagan's father was a... Uh, uh, alcoholic shoe salesman, had a very strong mother. In many of these cases, same thing with Richard Nixon, very strong mother. Um, of course, Obama's father left when, when he was an infant, and uh, he writes about it in his book, his autobiography, about how he had to create his own sense of self. Hmm. So, um, Thinking about uh, organizational life, then I mean, you you you've you've talked about uh, how you work with the these leaders, and um, I suppose all people have you and you've mentioned various types. You know, the visionary narcissistic type, the marketing visionary type, different types of personalities. I suppose it's quite difficult at times to um, for people to kind of work out which type of leader they're. Are kind of confronted with um, and I'm wondering if there's some kind of rules that are some type of way that people can navigate those types of challenges I mean you, the, the examples that you've given are all quite I suppose extreme ones in some ways you know they're kind of comparing the the, the, the Steve Jobs to the Adolf Hitlers or you know they're very but in the real you know in the kind of organizational world th things can be much more subtle in some ways well, first of all, I think it's very important if you're going, if you're going to understand another person, <clears throat> you better understand yourself, who you are, what is your own personality. You know, it's very interesting to me. Um, I'm both a psychoanalyst and an anthropologist, cultural anthropologist, and one thing I have learned is <clears throat> people don't understand another culture if they don't understand their own culture as a culture. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of personality. If you understand yourself, your own personality, you're much more sensitive. Uh, furthermore, you need, you need these concepts. Uh, you need language to under, understand these differences. Uh, and once you do, it's not all that difficult. I mean, the uh, uh, the problem, for example, of uh, 
understanding Donald Trump by these psychiatrists is they only have uh, pathological language. They don't have language for product, productive people, mm. not just narcissists. Mm. Any kind of personality. Mm. So you need uh, you need the concepts, the language. You need to observe, uh, and it's not so not so once once you have that once you're sensitive to it. It's pretty clear what people are like. And and thinking about. Uh... You know that I think uh, you you wrote a book uh, about the leaders we need um, a few years ago, and thinking about where we are now. I mean, what type of leaders do you think we need in 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 the world, the complex, uncertain world that we're currently in? Do you have a view on that? I think we need more uh, more leaders who really care about people and their development. I mean, I think if we look today at political leaders, who are the most effective, admired leaders? I think, uh, for example, Angela Merkel comes to mind. It's clear Angela Merkel cares about people. Uh, even her mistakes of bringing in too many uh, of refugees is a mistake of a caring person. Barack Obama, caring leader who who, who brought uh, policy for health care for millions of people who had no health care. So I think on the level of, of uh, all political governmental level, we need people who care about people and care about development, of human development. But on the other hand, going back to Adam Grant studies, people who are caring could be the worst or the best. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's very important that they develop not only um, caring policy, they have to develop um, a, a toughness also. They have to develop their hearts in a way which, so that they are courageous and strong-hearted, not hard-hearted and, or soft-hearted. Um, I think in terms of business, we need all types. Obviously, obviously, we need the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks, but alone they can't do it, and that's what we're seeing today in companies. Um, and for example, in the knowledge industry, in technology companies, healthcare, and so on, you need at least three types of leaders. You need the strategic leaders who are often productive narcissists. You need the operational leaders who may be exacting. But or obsessive types, and then you need people, leaders who are network leaders, who bring together different types of competence and ability and teams, and they're often much more the adaptive type of individual who can create collaboration, who can create trust, bring people together working on a common purpose. Mm. All three, we, we should not really today just talk about a leader. We should talk about a leadership system. Which leads, uh, I mean, we have, we have a question from, from, from one of the uh, listeners about uh, working with teams. And, and you're right, mo- most work is done in some type of team context or group context. And the question there was about um, if you have a predominance of narcissistic personalities in a team, you've talked about the balance, the need to kind of People who are supporting each other, bring diversity, can contribute in different ways. What happens when you've got a, a team full of kind of egoistic, narcissistic types? Some who may not be productive. How do you? How would you? How would you approach that? If you have a team full of narcissists who are not productive, um, <laughs> you, you better you better get out of it. Uh, <laughs> Gonna find a way out fast, um, <clears throat> that, because they're gonna they're gonna be Machiavellian types who are gonna do each other in. I mean, if you had a if you had a uh, if you had a team full of Iagos, um, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to deal with it. Uh, they're, they're gonna they're gonna have, they're gonna fight it out until somebody. Uh, takes over. But if you have a productive narcissist,
narcissist within a team, it's important to make sure that, that you use that capability, that vision, but don't let that person dominate. Um, you need to really work with that person uh, within the team to make use of their visionary capability. So what what does your uh, research tell us about leadership development, how leaders should be developed? I mean, you, you, you've talked about, you know, the need for more caring visionary types. Um, can organizations do anything about developing people who are kind of more in that kind of domain, if that's what you feel we need as a society and as, 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 as organizations? Well, first of all... Uh it's a good, very good question because what we're seeing today is huge amount of uh, investment in leadership training, billions of dollars, and the study, McKinsey study, show that seventy percent of the CEOs who are asked about the leadership training say it's either worthless or negative. Why? I think that's because it it doesn't look number one at the context. Um, somebody may be a good leader in one context and not in another. We see, for example, uh, leaders like Jerry Wang, who created Yahoo, who was totally inept once the company was large. He, he was great at the beginning. He did. He, unlike uh, Steve Jobs, he didn't realize he needed partnering and so on. So, first of all, any kind of Leadership development has to start out understanding the context and what it requires. What does the leadership require? Hmm. Second of all, you've got to look at the individual and what are their strengths and what needs to be developed. Um, and I think a lot of the view of strengths today doesn't get at the deep uh, motivational value strengths. They look at just behavioral strengths, which... Hmm. which um, <clears throat> to not sufficient. Third of all, uh, you need to help people develop their philosophy. Uh, if they don't develop a clear philosophy, if they they're, they're not going to be create a they're not going to develop their personality. Um, fourth, most leadership training doesn't teach people about followers. Who are they? What are their differences? What motivates them? I find in my research that people are motivated not by one thing or a simple thing, but by what I call the five R's, five, five different qualities. They're motivated by the reasons, the purpose, that whether it's inspiring or not. More and more we are seeing uh, young people today who want to be part of an organization where they're creating something that is uh, useful, that is, uh, develops the environment, the society. Uh, they they need to have develop good relationships. They need uh, they need to to look, keep in mind the importance of recognition. They need to put people in the kind of jobs that fit their values and skills, and they need to reward people for their accomplishments and achievements not just one it's not just one kind of thing it's uh, it's understanding the person the context and the, the mix of elements that engage people now keep in mind that also what we're seeing today with, uh, is that the majority of people at work are not engaged it makes a huge difference if you can engage people at work uh, in the United States it's only 30% are engaged. In the UK, it's even less. It's even fewer people engaged in their work. People are going through the motions, and they're angry. Uh, they feel, they don't feel people really care about their development. Um, I think if we, if one reason we have such a angry populist movements in, in, in our countries it's the lack of leadership that cares about people and their development. Hmm. The um, you you raise very interesting 
points about the importance of context and, and, and leadership. And I'm, I'm thinking about maybe more of a um, Buddhist kind of perspective on this if we, if we go further east. Quite often there, the, um, if, if, people, if people fail or they don't develop or succeed, quite often they, it's ascribed to the context, the context was the, was the was the reason for that here we we quite often blame the individual and we don't look at the context and i'm i'm just wondering uh what's your view in terms of you know uh more eastern philosophy or eastern perspectives on leadership and change and success and and so on and how they differ and how how does your model travel eastwards as it were well you know uh there's so much can be said about context. I like, uh, uh, there's a wonderful story by Stephen Vincent Bonnet, who imagines that Napoleon was born about 30 years earlier and is just a retired mm -hmm. um, major of artillery talking about all the things he could have achieved if he'd only had the chance. Um, the uh, Or... Or think of Winston Churchill was totally rejected by the British public before World War II because he wanted he, he wanted to arm Britain and so on. Um, we have to we have to constantly uh, we have to constantly look at what a particular context needs. You know, now, uh, Machiavelli understood this uh, that you needed a more visionary leader uh, in times of change and in times without change. You, do, you want more of an exacting leader. Um, I think uh, one of the problems Theresa May is having is she really is, she's not a, uh, a change leader. She's not a uh, visionary leader. She's much more of a exacting type. Mm. Um, um, and uh, uh, some some students at Stanford Business School took my questionnaire that you can find in in my book on uh, narcissistic leaders. I can find in the Strategic Intelligence, the more recent book I published. Um, and they did they gave that test to CEOs in uh, this Bay Area of San Francisco and uh, Silicon Valley. And what they found is that the DOs who are entrepreneurs of technology companies were all narcissists. Well, the people who were running kind of uh, manufacturing businesses were more exacting, and the people running service businesses were more adaptive in marketing. Mm. Um, so uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, to understand the point of context, and yet very few people teach it. They act like this one type fits all. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, someone, someone's um, kind of talked about made a, made an observation about leadership as being about your life, how you lead your life, not just um, you know how you um, turn up in the organisation, as if it's separate from your life, as it were. I suppose you, you, in a way, you've kind of answered that to some extent about having a need for a philosophy, a vision, a set of values. Uh, and so on, a, a kind of personal philosophy or story about yourself. But is there is there anything else that you might you might add to that sort of insight? I think the I think the point is that uh, I think this questioner was asking about um, pe people have trust in you as a leader if they feel that you you lead your own life well or lead your own life so. It's as much about, not necessarily about what you achieve, but how you achieve it, I suppose, that you, you live well. Well, you know, I, I've, seen, um, I've seen leaders who are very effective, very strong purpose and philosophy um, in their work, and I'm, I'm rather confused in their private life. Mm. I mean, if you take a look at Elon Musk, for example, here is somebody who's trying to create uh, 
improve um, the environment, create uh, energy that's clean, um, take the human race to Mars, and uh, he, he's had a number of divorces and, and messy family life. Um, so I don't think really, I mean, even if, if, look at uh, Albert Einstein, who, whose private life was a mess. Mm. Um, some people are able to combine it, both a, uh, a productive family life and a, um, and a productive leadership life. But, but it's not all that common. I, I had a visit just uh, this week from a manager of Amazon, and he was asking me that question. He said, in Silicon Valley, I see so many people, they're workaholic, they're, they're working all the time, they're, they're ignoring their families. Is it possible to have both a, a, a good family life and a good work life at the same time? Well, it's not easy today in some of these companies that are uh, entrepreneurial that are beginning. Uh, some people have been able to do it. Bill Hewlett was able to do it, but but many uh, many sacrifice uh, a lot of their family life uh, for this kind of vision. Mm. Uh, you have to you have to take make your choices. I suppose the irony is that uh, if most of them are men, and your observation is that sometimes productive narcissism comes from absent fathers, it becomes a self perpetuating cycle, doesn't it? They, um, they're absent. Well, that, that is true. Uh, but others um, would take a Barack Obama. He seems to really have, have maintained a, a close relationship with his family, with his daughters, uh, as well as being a, a really productive president. Hmm. So fi final, final question. I mean... Um, Thinking about the youth of today um, and about the kind of the leaders we need, you've talked about more caring visionary types. I mean, what, what, are, what, what are your observations about um, yeah, young leaders of today and um, what, what you're seeing emerging? I, I mean, do you have hope? Do you have um, for the future? Anxiety about the future? Well, I see one of the problems of many of the young leaders who are emerging is they, they, want to, they want to create something, but they don't really want to be leaders. Mm. They don't really want to deal with the people. Mm. They want to create the company. Mm. They want to change the world, like Mark Zuckerberg. But they don't, direct, they don't want to deal directly. I remember one, one person said to me, one of these leaders said to me some years ago, you know, I, I love dealing with the hardware and the software, but I can't stand dealing with the wetware. <laughs> uh, I think uh, <laughs> some of them say to me, well, artificial intelligence will take care of all the people. But we, it won't. It won't. Artificial intelligence has, has a... Has, cognitive it has a head but it doesn't have a heart hmm. and i think today the challenge is developing both the head and the heart hmm. together hmm. um that's that was that was the whole that that was the theme of everything i've been trying to teach ccc over the years and i i see uh that Many of people who want to be leaders today need to understand this. They need to understand you're not going to create relationships just on Facebook. You have to, you have to be in touch with people. You have to understand them, not just what they, not just their pictures or their Facebook, uh, what they put on Facebook. Hmm. Um, if you're going to really get people behind you, collaborate with you, and keep in mind. We are not engaging people at work. And uh, I think if we did more, we would have much more uh, of a sense of collaboration, community, uh, and caring about 
all of the people in our society, not just not just the elite who are doing so well in the global world. Hmm. Well, I think that's a nice uh, point on which to end, Michael, which is a, a, a kind of call for um, for people to relate more and um, kind of build build a, a future through the, the small things that they can do uh, in, in their immediate context. Um, thank you so much for uh, your words of wisdom, your insight, and uh, for answering uh, for, for the discussion, as always, which was very, very, very um, helpful. Um, for those uh, uh, who are listening, uh, thank you for your questions and also for, for attending this um, uh, webinar. If you want to find out more about the CCC program, for those of you who um, are interested in that, uh, you will find more details after the webinar. There will be a follow-up. So um, if you want to discuss anything about the program, please do. Uh, but for now, on this election day in the UK, uh, we'll see what type of leader we elect and uh, how we can categorise them. And maybe it's hopeful, maybe it's not. We'll find out tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye.